Um, thank you, Vidya, for those very kind words. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and thank you so much again for taking time to join me on this Saturday afternoon. Can all of you hear me? Okay, great. Um, my name is Jeffrey, and uh, as Vidya has already mentioned, I currently work at the ICC Sophie Shark Institute in Singapore, which is a research center that's dedicated to the study of social, political, and economic developments in Southeast Asia. Um, today's talk um, is part of a larger project that reconstructs uh, what we call the biographies of uh, different food items in Singapore's history. Um, some going back as far as the pre-colonial times. Um, today's talk, though, is going to look at a more recent period in Singapore's past, um, mostly from the 1980s onwards. Um, a full account of the Milo dinosaurs past, in my view, deserves a much longer historical treatment, but that isn't really our aim here today. Um, and that brings me to my second point. Um, can I have a please? Can I please have a quick show of hands? Um, how many of you already think the Milo dinosaur is part of Singapore's food heritage? Um, any hands? Okay, so a bit of a mix. Uh, maybe about a third of the audience. That's interesting. Okay, that's good. Um, this, is, this is exactly why this talk is, uh, is going on. Um, I've been given an hour to do it, uh, but I only want to spend about half an hour at the most talking to myself. Um, I'm really keen to hear your views about this drink. Um, food heritage, after all, is something that is shaped by all of us, by the wider community. Um, and everyone is a stakeholder at the end of the day. Um, and I, in a way, I see my role here really as more of a facilitator for discussion, in that sense. Um, just some quick words of thanks to particular individuals and institutions for their help and support uh, in making this event possible. Um, Gayatri Nadan um, and Tofa Wahid uh, have been working really hard behind the scenes as research assistants to help compile and analyze the historical data, some of it which comes into this presentation. Um, also, a quick word of thanks to Hun Yan Ming for her help with some of the newspaper research. Um, our project co-investigators, Dr. Lo Ka Singh, who uh, sadly can't be here with us today, but uh, he, uh, he's in the Philippines at the moment. Uh, Michael Yeo as well, in the front. Um, they've helped and conceptualized to, and drive this, driven this project since it began in 2018. Um, I also want to thank NHB for supporting um, this project with the Heritage Research Grant. And um, I'm also grateful to uh, NMS for hosting this event, and in particular, uh, Dr. Wong Hon for inviting uh, us to speak here today. Um, a point of clarification, um, our research is not sponsored by Nestle. Um, uh, is, there, is there anyone here who works for Nestle in the audience? No? Okay, good. All right. Uh, we are not, we're not here on behalf of Nestle. Uh, but in saying that, um, during the course of our research, we ended up drinking a lot more Milo and Milo dinosaur than usual while actually doing the writing research for this talk. This had nothing to do with any notion of science. We weren't trying to do taste tests or find out which was the best version of it. Um, it had more to do with just inner cravings um, while constantly thinking and remembering the drink while researching and writing about it. It, it was it's a bit torturous in a way. And a lot of us here in the audience probably grew up drinking Milo. Um, and maybe the Milo dinosaur as well. And its taste has been imprinted on us since childhood, um, some of us anyway. So at this point, I'm sure some of you are thinking, um, of all the possible things we could have researched on, why of all things do we have to choose the Milo dinosaur? We not have chosen something more traditional, um, more Asian. You know, we are in the heart of Asia. What's, what's going on? Well, the drink itself, um, as we soon see, actually poses, I think, some really interesting questions about what it means to be a heritage food in today's context in Asia. Um, and our decision to choose the Milo dinosaur as one of our case studies was also shaped, um, as historians would say, by the abundance of material that was already available uh, that we could use to flesh it out and analyze its uh, life and time, so to speak. Okay. Um, the context that we live in today includes a lot of what we can call living heritage, um, heritage that's actively practiced and promoted across Singapore. Not in the past, but today. Um, and not all of, but a great deal of it, of what we consider traditional or Asian food heritage has arguably already been branded and mass produced, um, often for international or overseas audiences. Um, it includes complete dishes like chili crab, kaya toast, some sweet chicken, um, and when I last checked outside at the shop, we had notebooks with the Milo dinosaur on the front cover um, and badges as well. Uh, but also we we're talking about just basic ingredients, sauce kits, including uh, laksa paste, chicken rice paste, fish balls, um, 
tofu, uh, soy sauce, Maggi seasoning. You know, what we think about when we think about what makes something that we eat and drink part of Singapore's heritage and traditions, uh, most of us don't really think too hard about it. Um, and that's fine. It's either yes or no. We make a snap judgment and that's usually enough to, to, to keep things going. But as academics, as, as, uh, for me, um, there are plenty of grey areas which do matter. Um, and I would like us to treat the Milo dinosaur as part of a thought experiment. Um, it might push boundaries that at times we feel a bit uncomfortable considering, but it's important, I think, that we try and have these uh, discussions about such boundaries uh, because through them we can learn a lot about our assumptions, our food heritage, and even the society that we live in today. Now, to answer this question about Milo D um, and its, its place in Singapore's food landscape, we can start to think about the question in three different ways. Um, I think it's useful to think about it geographically. Um, if you want to put it cutely, uh, the Milo dinosaur's habitat and range, so to speak. Um, it's an open secret that it's popular regionally, especially in Malaysia. But are there aspects of the drink which are especially local, um, Singaporean? Is there a subspecies of the drink in Singapore, so to speak? Um, and what about know-how, the craftsmanship that goes into the drink, um, or in a more legalistic way, the property rights associated with recipes and preparations. Um, who are the custodians of the Milo dinosaur? Um, are they individuals? Are they families? Coffee shop vendors? Big businesses? Uh, who does the Milo dinosaur really belong to in that sense? And who does it benefit when it's made and sold? And of course, drunk. And finally, food and food is often seen as a way to bring people together. In other words, sharing a, an identity and making a, a community of sorts. And does the Milo dinosaur really do this? Um, who does it exclude? Um, who does it include? Um, does it really matter at the end of the day? Okay, um, are any of you not familiar with what a Milo dinosaur is before I go on further? Everyone knows? Okay, that's great. What about Milo itself? Everyone knows what Milo is, right? Okay, um, so excellent. Milo, malted chocolate powder, usually used to make drinks, made by Nestle, uh, currently the world's biggest food company, by the way. Um, and also, I would say, possibly responsible for some of the haze that's going on outside, which is making it a bit hard for me to talk at the moment, because Milo has got two ingredients in it, which come from tree crops that are produced in this region. I see some of you nodding. One of them is palm oil, uh, and the other one is cocoa. So we've got two of those things, but we don't know how to really trace it, so that's another question that we put aside for later. Um, as for Milo dinosaur, I'll just go to the basics. Um, it's basically Milo powder blended with sugar, hot water, milk, chilled with ice cubes, and then you crown it with several spoonfuls of Milo powder on top. So the recipes, of course, vary. Um, some coffee shops give three spoonfuls, others as many as five spoonfuls, um, which is about just as much that's already inside the liquid that's chilled to begin with. Uh, so it's times two. So it's a bit like a milkshake. Um, but not exactly like one either. <clears throat> so there are several ways to trace the birth of the Milo dinosaur. Um, the first story has to do with our little Singapore. And in this story, the Milo dinosaur was invented by Indian Muslim open-air eateries in Singapore during the mid-1990s. The kinds of eateries that were already serving very sweet, uh, sweetened milky drinks like Teh Tarik, Bandung, and Ice Milo. Um, and some of the claimants include uh, A&A Muslim Restaurant in Sembawang, um, or used to be in Sembawang, Al Azhar Eating Restaurant near uh, Beauty World Shopping Center, Al Amin Eating House, also near Beauty World, their neighbors sharing the same street. Um, and one newspaper account claims that Nestle actually went to Al Amin to ask for the permission to use the names Milo Dinosaur, Milo Godzilla, and Milo King Kong. And these are all variations of the Milo dinosaur. Um, for those of you un unfamiliar, Milo Godzilla is Milo D with a scoop of vanilla ice cream on top, sometimes a whipped cream. Milo King Kong is two scoops, and maybe with the whipped cream as well. Um, Nestle went to Alamin and asked them for permission to use the names of these three drinks for their own marketing purposes, which sounds really weird to me. Um, why should Nestle be asking for permission to use its own Milo trademark? Um, so we'll come back to this a bit later. 
Anyway, the other question, of course, is why these monstrous names, Ra? You know, one reason is presumably to get customers to imagine a larger, rowdier version of the ice milo that was already being sold, something that was fiercer, something bigger, a bit more intimidating, more fun. The other reason was something which had to do with the times of that period. We had a cinema culture in the early 1990s and early 2000s where popular imagination in this region was dominated by films about giant lizards and apes. So we had Jurassic Park, which started in 1993. Um, I think uh, one, two, and three were until 2001. And then the last one, Jurassic World, was in, was in 2015. Um, so it's, it's always there in the background. And then we had Godzilla, which came out in 1998. Not, not the current 2019 one, which, which I haven't seen yet, but um, this one definitely wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was made by the folks who gave us Independence Day. So it's big blockbuster special effects, um, loud. And then we've got King Kong 2005, which was a much better um, movie. Um, so these were all sort of happening around the same period and it's part of a public consciousness in a way. Now, of course, things are never that simple when it comes to food and food histories. Um, we have a second origin story, and that's looking at Malaysia itself. And in this story, Milo Dinosaur was born in Malaysia by the mid-1990s, around the same time. But it was served under a different name, and this name was the Milo Shake. And it was served at roadside stalls. And of, uh, we have um, none other than KFC To our local food champion, who talks about this in an interview. He says that uh, in the past, uh, we had something similar to the Mailudi that was served in Malaysia at roadside stores, and I had this myself. Um, but it wasn't just him. Um, Singapore vendors also knew about the Milo shake. And when they were interviewed around the same time in the mid-2000s, they claimed that, well, yes, we know about the Milo shake in Malaysia, but our Milo dinosaur is different. It's more chocolatey and it's more creamy. Okay. So nevertheless, many Malaysians remain convinced that the Milo dinosaur is a Malaysian creation. Now, <laughs> there's probably never going to be a clear answer, and maybe there isn't a point to try and ask who, who started it first. That's not really the point. But we should note also that Malaysia has had one of the highest, it has had the highest per head consumption of Milo in the world. Um, and guess who's in second place? Singapore. So we are still partners in many ways um, all these years. Uh, also, a quick aside, uh, did you also know that the slogan Malaysia Bole was coined by Nestle for Milo's sponsorship of Malaysia's uh, Sea Games effort in 1993? So you can see how ingrained um, Nestle is in, in the national culture um, in Malaysia and we'll see later in Singapore as well. And this, of course, brings us to Nestle itself which is our third point of origin. And the Milo dinosaur's main ingredient, um, as we've said before, Milo powder was developed in Australia by an Australian chemist working for Nestle Australia. And his name was Thomas Main, and he was working on it during the Great Depression at the time when he wanted to find, according to the Nestle story, he was trying to find a drink that would help children who were in need of more nutrition. So there you have him, uh, not in the 1930s, this is him in the 1980s, still going strong, still loving his Milo. Um, he was a devout uh, promoter of Milo to the very end. He had a cup of it reputedly every day um, to the end of his days. Uh, but in the 30s, Milo was first made in Australia, the powder itself, and then it was exported and it was marketed in places such as British Malaya, it's a fortified tonic food for the middle classes in the mid-30s uh, onwards. So this is a point where, as you know, um, Singapore and mainland Malaya were both part of the same, um, arguably the same political entity and also the same integrated market as well. So a lot of the advertising, a lot of the material culture was interlinked. Um, after Malaysia and Singapore achieved independence in the 50s and 60s. Nestle continued its advertising and sponsorships, but now it took place along national lines in both states, and Milo was now being seen and promoted as a national drink. It wasn't just in the realm of consumption. Um, in production as well, Milo was soon manufactured in the, by the early 70s in both Singapore and Malaysia. 
So what, what does all this mean? In this telling, Milo Dinosaur is ultimately the outcome of Singapore and Malaysia's joint colonial legacy, and as well as their continued openness to Swiss capital um, with a bit of an Australian face. But don't take my word for all this, okay? Let's just ask everyone else outside with the rest of the world where they think Milo Dinosaur comes from. So in the Philippines, nine-tenths of residents already consume Milo, and some shops do sell Milo D, and they sell it as a Singaporean offering. Um, one of these shops happens to be a shop that's run by KFC To, Makan Sutra. So he's doing, doing his, his job and waving the flag. In Hong Kong, it's often served as a Malaysian specialty um, by a Malaysian F&B brand known as Papa Rich. In Australia and the UK, uh, you have both Singaporean and Malaysian F&B businesses that are selling Milo Dinosaur. Um, so you get different narratives depending on who you go to. Um, and also sometimes consumers themselves call it the hot chocolate of the Far East, which has this sort of colonial nostalgic sense to it, um, which is interesting as well. Uh, and lastly, in New York itself, uh, the Milo Dinosaur um, was featured in 2015, thanks in part to the Singapore Tourist Promotion Board and uh, KFC Tho, who brought it in, and uh, it was written up as a Singaporean food. Yeah. So in, in short, the answer depends on who's selling it. Um, in, in many cases, national branding efforts uh, often determine the prevailing narrative. <clears throat> now to make matters just slightly more complex, um, we, when we're moving on to who are the, the craftsmen of Milo Dinosaur, there's a fourth origin story that lies with families themselves. Um, so we get to the, the nice big popular um, narrative. So before the Milo Dinosaur got its official name, families in Australia, Singapore, and Malaysia were arguably already preparing versions of the drink already, but they didn't call it that. They didn't call it the Milo Dinosaur then. It wasn't branded in that sense. Um, the thing about Milo, as many of you will know, is that it's actually more coarse, more gritty, crunchy than a lot of hot chocolate powder, which is very fine. Um, and if you try and put hot chocolate powder in your mouth, hot cocoa, um, it just sort of clogs up your whole mouth, and it's almost suffocating because it's so fine. Whereas Milo, if you have it in a spoonful, you've got a, it's, it's palatable, it's, it's delicious. And in this story, according to Nestle, Thomas Maine settled on the coarse texture of Milo by accident in the early 30s. He actually found his children eating a Milo prototype in the family kitchen. And they were eating it because they couldn't actually get it to dissolve in the milk properly. So he went, oh, okay, it's actually not such a bad thing. I don't need to make it dissolve fully. It's fine as it is. It's delicious. Um, so I'm going to sell this as a virtue instead. So children, maybe children are the key to the Milo dinosaur. And certainly, we find that by the 50s and the 60s, once refrigeration becomes widespread in homes in Malaysia and in Singapore, um, Milo becomes even harder to dissolve in milk because the milk is often taken from the fridge cold to begin with. It's not room temperature. It's not condensed milk, which is also at room temperature. So this led to many episodes where children, sometimes children who couldn't boil their own hot water, but just got the milk straight from the fridge, made their own Milo dinosaurs at home. Uh, so both on purpose and also by accident. And we have testimonials that actually talk about this. So it's a it's a, it's a nice story, you know, it's about um, innovation from the bottom up, uh, but okay, we'll come to that in a moment. So a history of Milo dinosaur is then also a history of eating Milo in rather strange ways. Um, maybe not strange to us because we are from this region. So we have generations of children, um, our children, our, our fathers, our mothers, our grandparents who ate Milo when they could straight from the tin. Uh, often without their parents knowing. Um, we had children who were sprinkling Milo on bread. Maybe their parents would do it for them as well. Um, so we go from that pre-Milo dinosaur to Milo dino dinosaur itself. And we can actually start to see Milo dinosaur becoming, in a way, the ideal concoction to play with. So one vendor in Singapore in the mid-2000s was interviewed about this drink because it was quite a novelty then. And he said, well, you know why it's popular? I see, you know, these kids, well, when they get the, the dinosaur, the Milo powder falls all over the ice, and then they start to lick it, they roll it, and then they, they put it over their tongues and enjoy its texture. So you can see this, this, this trace that goes all the way back um, decades, in a sense. Now, what does Nestle think about all this? They probably love it 
it's been a new growth sector for them, in a way. It, you know, it gives you an opportunity to sell lots more Milo powder, but I think more importantly, it also keeps the Milo brand in the spotlight. Um, and in fact, in January 2009, um, there was a news article interview uh, featuring Nestle's then managing director. Um, and he was quoted by a reporter stating that the Milo dinosaur's development took place in a Singapore coffee shop. He didn't give a name, adding to the mystery. And he said that this development was a partial result of some input from a Nestle sales team. And he doesn't give any more details about that, in that sense. So we, we don't really know for sure. But what we, can, what, we can look, what we can do is place what they did in a bigger context of Milo's tie-ups with coffee shops, both now past and present. So most recently, we've got things such as the Milo Towers, um, which are like beer towers but only full of Milo instead. And these, uh, these have been um, a product of close collaboration with Nestle. If we go further back, uh, we've got things like porcelain saucers, which were distributed to coffee shops. Um, so these were ways for Nestle to get its uh, branding out to, to the vendors. And you didn't even have to drink Milo uh, to actually know what the product was because it was featured on the saucers if you had coffee anyway. And by the way, uh, the National Museum has got some of these saucers in their collection at the gallery. So uh, if you want to have a look, uh, two more days till they close that exhibition. Uh, put up, tie in. Um, we also have recipes for households. So it wasn't just the fact that Milo was tying up with vendors. They were also trying to reach out to families uh, in their homes. Um, in the late 50s, in uh, newspapers that were circulating, and what was still Malaya at the time, both Malaysia and Singapore, um, they were featuring something called Milo Delight, um, which was something uh, urging families to sprinkle Milo over bread, uh, together with condensed milk. Um, and in the late 2000s, this came up again, but now it was being pushed through vendors and it was being called Milo Toast in conjunction with Nestle. We go back even further to 1940, we have a recipe in, I think it was uh, one of the papers, the Malay Tribune, um, which sounds awfully similar to the Milo Dinosaur. So it says, um, You see this one here? Uh, so this is, this is a suggestion what you can make for your daughter. Let's make a Milo milkshake. Pour hot water into a shaker, add sugar, float Nestle's milk powder and Milo on top. So you want to get that mix and make it hot and make sure it dissolves some of the Milo and milk powder. Shake it well and then open the shaker and then insert ice to cool it down. Shake well again and then pour it into a tumbler. And if you like it rich, add a tablespoonful of Nestle's cream. So it's... It's almost there, not quite. You don't have that, those additional spoonfuls of Milo powder on top. Um, but essentially, you're getting you know, a lot of these, uh, these ideas which are coming from the company itself. What I haven't been able to find out yet is whether the company got the ideas from people outside. Um, and to do that would require a different set of sources, which we unfortunately haven't gotten to yet. Now, so far... I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how this works, but the knowledge of how embedded Nestle is in our food culture, I'm not sure how, how, how it bothers people, whether it, it's an issue for people or not. But we're talking today about food heritage. Um, and one third of us here are quite happy to say that Milo Dinosaur is already part of our food heritage. So in both Singapore and Malaysia, it's been embraced arguably as a drink, bringing people together. Uh, typically consumed at hawker stores, coffee shops, um, uh, Indian Muslim eateries. It's been essentially naturalized, like Teh Tarik, like Bandung, like Kopio, like Teh Si. Uh, the most high-profile episode for Milo dinosaur so far, arguably, uh, has to do with Joseph Schooling in 2016. So as, uh, as many of you will know, he was Singapore's uh, first ever Olympic gold medalist, is Singapore's first ever gold medal, Olympic bleh, medalist in swimming. And when he set out on his victory parade in Singapore after coming back from the Olympics, he took a tour of the country to thank his fans. And I think many of you may still know this, still remember this. He made sure to stop by a hawker center at Marine Terrace Market. And there in front of Singapore's entire media scene, and he was crowded in by his fans, um, he had a short, quick gulp of his childhood favorite Milo Dinosaur, made by the drink store vendor who had been serving schooling and his 
family as regular customers for the past seven years. So schooling didn't have time to finish the whole mug, of course. Um, it was a strategic decision, arguably. Um, and it paid off for him, for the vendor, and for Nestle as well. Um, and Milo's been happy to sponsor him since uh, the Olympic Games. Um, they've seen in Joseph, I think, uh, a winning combination of sportsmanship, national achievement, homegrown talent, and someone whom the general Singaporean public can relate to through food habits. Yeah. Also, um, just another short diversion again. If you look at the packet that features Joseph and you go to the left, um, you can see here Nestle's been marketing the Milo dinosaur. Uh, and these are, I don't know whether any of you have these. These are plastic collectibles. They're about this size. Um, but it's not just the Milo D as well. They've got other things you can collect. You can collect the Milo van. You can collect the Milo van uncle. And you can also collect a Milo soccer, soccer boy. Um, and these three are all, in a way, nostalgia. And they're trading on memories of past times because, quite frankly, our soccer is not quite what it used to be anymore. <laughs> okay. So this, again, brings us back to Milo, a much longer history of community consumption um, that the Milo dinosaur actually draws from. Um, and I don't want to talk too much about Milo because this is really about the dinosaur itself, but we can't ignore Milo itself. It's been promoted in Singapore and Malaysia since the 1930s as something that was quite rare at the time. It was seen as a hygienic, a nourishing, a relatively affordable drink, um, at least for the middle classes at first, and that was something that was not easily found. And certainly by the 50s and 60s, brewing Milo with cow's milk had become a habit for growing numbers of families wanting to raise healthy children. In Singapore especially, um, most families started having children in the 50s and 60s because that was when we had more women in Singapore. Before then, it was very much a male-dominated society. So Milo comes in at a point where families are starting to be part of the natural landscape. Children are starting to be part of people's um, uh, aspirations and, and, um, and investments as well, in a way. But you also, in places like Singapore at the same time, have a situation where more, pe more women are going into the formal workforce in the 60s because of industrialization. Um, incomes are rising for households, but at the same time, time within the family is becoming increasingly scarce. So an instant drink, an instant food, which could be stored away easily for future use and was yet tasty and also full of healthful goodness, became something that was the right product for the right times. And I, I, love, I love this particular advert here. Um, this came out in 1952. I don't think it was specifically marketed for an Asian market because the aesthetics don't, don't look like they are. Um, we've got others which are comic strips which talk about the rubber plantations and, and, um, and fishing industries in this region. But I like this one because it, it just really captures that, that sense. I think the marketing reps really knew what they were doing. Um, they were targeting mothers, um, housewives, um, and you can see, you know, you've got the club that's going crazy, it's go time is going out of control, you've got uh, uh, a mother who's maybe, I don't know what she's doing, mirroring herself um, on, as a puppet on strings, so she, she doesn't have much control over time as well. And the way to gain back that control, in a way, is to try some Milo and get that time back, in a way without sacrificing the health of your kids. But this wasn't just a middle-class thing. Um, Nestle was also sending free samples to uh, all sorts of communities, including remote communities on Singapore, Singapore's outer islands, some of whom were what we, I guess, call to the Orang Lawut. Um, and in these communities, it was seen not as an everyday drink, but as this prestigious luxury item. And for many people in the mainland as well, it was something that was a luxury, but um, certainly in the outer islands, it was seen as that. And what happened there was that when they had guests over, uh, visitors, nurses coming over, they would actually take out the Milo and put in a lot of sugar and serve it to them. Um, so it was a sort of special occasion drink, prestigious, uh, modern, um, something you wanted to impress your visitors with. Uh, very social. Yeah. Um, and then there were still children who somehow weren't in this loop. They weren't accustomed to having Milo. 
So Nestle made sure that they gave out plenty of free samples at amusement parks, at schools. And of course, we can't not mention the Milo vans that introduced generations of school kids to ice cold Milo at special occasions like sports days. So with each, oh, sorry about this. Um, Work. Okay, right. With each successive generation of Milo drinkers in Singapore and Malaysia and elsewhere, we get a situation where, in the fifties, you get the first generation. In the seventies, you get a second generation. In the nineties, a third. Milo dinosaur comes in by the third generation, and now you have a fourth generation who have had their childhoods arguably with Milo dinosaur, like Joseph Schooling. And this is this is what heritage is about. It's one generation to the next. It's drinking a cup of Milo that makes you think about perhaps what your grandparents were drinking when they were growing up as well. And you connect to them through time in that sense. You're going back in history. And for your grandparents, for your, your, for your parents as well, um, they're making this drink um, in a way which triggers their own memories and it connects them with uh, their kids as well. Now, what are the limits of this narrative which Nestle would love? Um, who does the Milo dinosaur actually exclude? Um, who's left out? Um, this is something which I'm not quite sure about. I, I, as far as I know, there are no religious prohibitions on drinking Milo. Um, uh, quite the opposite as far as I know. Uh, so in Malaysia, we have a case quite recently where a local ustas in Malaysia was scolding um, traders who were delivering uh, Milo to vendors to, to stop adulterating Milo, stop selling fake Milo to customers because you are not being honest. You need to sell the real thing to your customers. Um, but aside from religion, aside from custom, there are also, there are also genuine biological concerns uh, for quite a lot of us. And one of the reasons why Milo, I think, is often seen as a drink of the young is not just because it's sold that way, but it also contains a lot of lactose. Um, about one-eighth of Milo's composition is made up of lactose, which is uh, some of you may know it's a sugar found in milk. It's a naturally occurring sugar. Um, and many Asians, especially uh, ethnic Chinese, um, start to lose the ability to digest lactose uh, by young adulthood, including myself. And I have a theory about this, actually, um, that I, I just wanted to float for all of you, um, see what you think. The adults who can't drink Milo, but grew up drinking it and can still remember its taste, end up passing on this inheritance to their children because they want their kids to have what they did growing up, or to put it crudely, they want to actually live through their children, in a way. I don't know what you think, but, but I just thought I'd float that out there. The other issue, of course, is a more general health concern more recently about junk food. Um, so in both Singapore and Malaysia, the last three to five years or so, we've had very highly publicized concerns about rising levels of diabetes and obesity in both countries. And this is part of a swing against sugar, sugar and sugary foods, including Milo and the Milo dinosaur. And this is a bit ironic when you consider that Milo has long been marketed for its health benefits, as many of you know. It, it's, it's not like Cheezos. It's not like some obvious junk food where it doesn't pretend to have any nutritional value. Um, it does contain useful protein. It does contain calcium. And it is fortified with vitamins and minerals. And historically, it's good to remember that Milo was a way to get kids to drink milk. Yeah, by making it sweeter, making it more palatable, giving it a chocolatey taste. That was how you got milk to go into kids and make them grow up stronger and taller as well. But, you know, we live now in a part of the world where cheap, nutritious food is now abundant. So this argument doesn't really hold to some extent. Um, and also, I don't think people really drink the Milo dinosaur for its health benefits. Right? Does anyone do that? Sorry if you do, but it's not really healthy. People obviously are not in it for health. They're in it for, for pleasure, for, for gastronomy. They, they, it's, it's like food that we eat for recreation. We, we eat it to, to, to socialize, to, to reminisce, um, to, to celebrate, um, and also just to escape from the tedium of daily life. Um, and that, in a way, is one of the definitions of food heritage. It brings people together. So, just to conclude, um, one way we can anchor the definition of food heritage is to look at UNESCO's guidelines for what we call intangible cultural heritage, which, how many of you um, are unfamiliar with the term intangible cultural heritage? Um, okay, 
yeah, it's the same, it's the same uh, category that Singapore's hawker culture bid is being put under. So it's about heritage that's in knowledge and all that. Um, I just want to go through the definitions briefly because they also apply to food heritage. Um, intangible cultural heritage is traditional, contemporary, and living at the same time. It's not only inherited traditions from the past, but contemporary practices. Um, it's inclusive, it contributes to social cohesion, encouraging a sense of identity and responsibility which helps individuals to feel part of different communities. It also is representative because it thrives on its basis in communities and depends on their knowledge, their traditions and skills and customs being passed on to the rest of the community from one generation to the next. So, despite being synonymous with the corporate brand, brand of Nestle, the world's largest food company today, I repeat again, the Milo dinosaur does appear to fulfill these criteria. So that provokes another question, what role can and should corporations play in food heritage today? And I just want to end by, by suggesting that we need to look beyond just worrying about our traditional Asian food heritage becoming mass produced and watered down. And we need to start thinking about heritage that has its roots in recent history, in a, in a time when multinational corporations do dominate our, much of our, what we eat today. And we like it in a way. We like what we eat. Otherwise, we wouldn't eat it. Okay. And that's all for now. Um, I look forward to questions and uh, having a discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. This was very um, enlightening. I won't torture you with uh, or the audience with um, academic questions, but I have a couple of minor questions. Um, one thing is, um, I mean, I I'm from Europe, um, not from the island um, in Europe, but from continental Europe. and. Milo is something that you normally don't get there. Maybe you get it in special um, shops. So do you have any idea why uh, Nestle actually made this decision not to sell Milo in continental Europe? I mean, it's very much a British Empire thing, but um, a Swiss company is not necessarily the um, British Empire. So um, that's one thing. And the um, other question is, um, do you actually um, see um, connections to um, Horlicks? Because this is also, um, to a certain degree, um, something that you would in Europe not necessarily um, get as a drink. I mean, there is no uh, Horlicks dinosaur and so on, but um, it still has this touch of baby food, uh, healthy food and so on, that, as you mentioned, is maybe not necessarily something you'd link to a Milo dinosaur, but at least uh, the idea um, that you would actually eat large amounts of uh, Milo powder is already an idea that um, I think... Um, it's not necessarily something that uh, in European culture would be promoted. I mean, it would be seen as a luxury or at least uh, be seen as a kind of sign of uh, decadence, I would even say. So, I mean, they, when we talk about um, um, Thomas Mann and so on, um, his um, stories about uh, 19th century culture, if you're drinking um, hot chocolate every day, then um, you're already um, a decadent person, so to speak. Yeah, anyway, thank you. Hello, is this one? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, sorry, you're Stefan, right? Stefan Hubner, yes. Um, I, I, I sort of have to ask the question, are these, uh, are you talking about adults eating the powder or children eating the powder? Generally. Mm. Well, what, what, what we've done with Milo Dinosaur today um, is just, uh, you know, we, we're doing a very small study in what is, I guess, a much bigger field of 
drinks which are malted drinks. Um, and you've got, as you as you've rightly mentioned, Horlicks, um, you've got Milo. Um, the other one that came before Milo in this region was Ovaltine, um, and that started off in the early 1900s. Um, and that was marketed also by a Swiss company. Um, so it, it is peculiar that the Swiss are making these malted beverages. Uh, Horlicks, I think, was an English brand, actually. It was a British brand. Um, but the Swiss uh, were, were exporting um, uh, initially uh, Ovaltine and then after that um, Milo um, to, to many parts of the world, and including Malaysia and Singapore. The, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm, I'm rambling. One, one thing that's suge been suggested to me is that we don't actually have a beer drinking culture in this region. And beverages like Horlicks would be more uh, symmetric with that. They would, you know, it's easier to go with that because people don't have that. They're not accustomed to something so sweet in their diets. Um, but I, I really think that the more interesting question for me in a way is um, when did we actually get interested in chocolate in our region? Um, because it's not something that... that it's, it's part of, it's not indigenous to our culture. Um, it's, it's, when did chocolate, when did um, um, drinking chocolate as well as solid chocolate become something that we just assume is naturally uh, part of our desserts? Um, that, that, that sweetness in that sense. And the, the chocolate sweetness itself. Um, that's, that's something I'm interested in too. Yeah, sorry. Um, we, we can talk more about it later, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm just curious about Indonesia. Why hasn't Milo taken off, or has it taken off already? Because the the cultural and the culinary context of Indonesia is actually quite similar to Malaysia and Singapore. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention Indonesia. Uh, for various reasons. One is that this was really supposed to be a talk about Singapore to begin with, um, and I didn't want to take it too far away. Uh, but um, the Indonesian case, we didn't do very much research on it, but the, the sense is that um, because it was a Dutch colony, um, the marketing channels were a bit different, and Van Houten was actually one of the companies that had privileged access to the market in Indonesia at the time. Um, I have to fact check this, of course, uh, but clearly there was a question of what we call imperial preference coming in by the mid-1930s, by, by the mid and certainly around the same time that Milo was being marketed. So you start to see goods being marketed along national empire lines, in that sense. That's not to say that Indonesia doesn't have a thing for Milo, um, but I think it's, it's seen as a sort of latecomer to the process. Um, we, they don't, Milo dinosaur isn't really a big thing there, but we've got what we call uh, Milo, Milo ice kepal, which is uh, Milo ice kacang, essentially. It's a Milo ice ball, rather. Um, so it's Milo syrup poured on top of an ice ball. So you get these, these incredible fusions which are taking place. You've got ice kacang coming in from, from the region, but you've got Milo being brought in in a new way as well. Um, but that, that came from Malaysia, apparently. It was made by some vendors in Selangor. And then uh, somebody in Indonesia uh, took up the, the, the idea and it, it started spreading in Jakarta as well. Yeah. Hi, Jeffrey. Thank you for your talk, I enjoyed it. Actually, I'm just wondering, right, um, do you actually have conversations with like local Singaporeans about how they actually see Milo dinosaur as part of the Singapore food heritage? And if yes, maybe you could talk more about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have talked to a few people. Um, nothing, nothing too formal, nothing too structured. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why uh, I chose this this uh, case study to begin with was that people I was asking um, generally seemed to say, yeah, yeah, I would consider it part of our food heritage. Um, but I didn't ask them why. Um, uh, and maybe that's something that 
we could do in future um, if we have more money uh, <laughs> or more time uh, to put it yeah, in, a, in a nicer way. Um, yeah, but I mean, this is one of the reasons why, why I, I'm, I'm so glad we're here in a way because we, we need to have these conversations. Um, and um, the, the more people we can, we can talk to, the, the, the better. Um, there will be there will be something that will be published out of this, um, and maybe that will get a bit more circulation as well, a bit more feedback. Um, and we'll have a few more talks, but about other food items as well that are on our checklist of of our project. So we have to sort of balance our time out between different items as part of the research. Uh, Milo seems to have edged out Ovaltine as a competitor in a chocolate malt drink, right? Does it have to do with better branding and efforts like the Milo dinosaur? Uh, to answer that, we need the Nestle rep here. <laughs> yeah. I was hoping they would come, but yeah, we need their archives actually. We need their marketing archives. The archives, are, I mean, they're in Switzerland. Um, but um, I, I'm sure there's documentation here as well. And maybe some of you might know people who work for Nestle and you can ask them that question as well. Don't do it on my behalf, please, but just, just, just ask around. And it, you know, one of the things that historians love to do is to find out where, where these sources are. It's a, it's a community effort in a way. And you know, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a fascinating question because Ovaltine, as far as I could see from the newspaper records, was was neck and neck with Milo up until the 80s and even the 90s. It was often mentioned the same breath. It was part of the Holy Trinity, forgive me, forgive the term. Milo, Horlicks, and Ovaltine were, all, were always those three that were mentioned. You could, you could have those if you didn't want coffee or tea. Those were the three. But those, those sorts of references start to die off in the newspapers by, by after the 90s after that. So it, it could be a marketing tactic, I don't know. The other, the other thing is that I don't know how many of you know this. Wanda, which is the company that was producing Ovaltine, um, that, that, that held the trademark for Ovaltine, the Swiss company, they, they were producing Milo on behalf of Nestle in Singapore during the 70s. Whereas Nestle was producing Ovaltine for... Uh, Nestle was producing Ovaltine for Wanda in Malaysia during the 70s. So they had a production sharing agreement going on. They didn't build factories of their own in both countries. So what I said there was not quite the full story. Um, and one of the reasons why they did it, I suspect, was to avoid catastrophic competition. You, you kind of want to do a production sharing agreement when your markets are still developing and the region itself is still developing. Um, and now, now they're producing, um, now Nestle is producing on both sides because the market is a lot bigger. And they've got the R&D facility in Singapore as well. But the world's biggest Milo factory is in Malaysia. I have a question, sorry, um, if I can ask the audience about this. Um, I, I talked about not, Milo not having religious prohibitions, but I'm always curious, is Milo supposed to be Hiti? It is, right? Um, does, does having it at a certain time of the day um, have any effects on, on the effect of heatiness itself? Whether at breakfast or at... at at bedtime? Uh, does anyone know anything about this? You know? Because this is really an area which, which, which we, we uh, could know more about. Um, from my understanding, um, usually you don't want to eat heaty stuff at night. Um, so the, the TCM doctors usually recommend that, for example, if you want to uh, do a jog, it's preferred that you do in the morning because um, if you jog at night, it, um, it's too much on your liver. So for the same reason, you do not want to uh, take heaty stuff at night. So like things for like ginger, which is also heaty, it's preferred that you, you take it in the morning. So um, before Milo Dinosaur, my understanding of um, Milo is usually drank in the morning, if, at home especially, because I was given Milo uh, as part of my breakfast when I used to go to school. Yeah, so that's my understanding.
All right, so uh, thank you so much for the fascinating presentation. So this is more of a comment than, uh, than a question. So I found it really interesting uh, in your presentation that especially concerning the marketing of Milo, the earlier marketing has this very obvious gendered approach, focusing on the mom, focusing on the family, and how, uh, how to basically, by serving a cup of Milo to the kids, will allow you to achieve this kind of ideal womanhood to become a good mother. And later on, I found it this very, um, very dramatic shift towards, oh, you know, consuming Milo is all about, you know, sports, athletic, and then healthiness in a sense, well, according to the marketing, right? So I wonder though, uh, let's say, um, let's say in, let's say, whether anyone, let's say, whether you have talked to or in any of the archive has any specific gendered narratives about, let's say, Milo being, uh, Milo being, let's say, healthy, or Milo being part of, uh, you know, the social life and such and such. So that's just a com comment plus question. Thank you. Thanks. Um, that's that's a great question. Um, what what we didn't have time, in a way, to to show here uh, was the history of advertising um, with Milo itself, um, and our sources mainly were. Were NLB's um, digital newspaper archive, which is a which is a great source, um, especially for English um, and Chinese language newspapers. Um, the interesting there are, there are some interesting breaks in the way the marketing develops. Um, in the thirties, in the mid thirties, it's marketed primarily towards Europeans, um, and it only starts being marketed towards Asians after World War II, for reasons that we can make um, good guesses about. Um, like you said, it starts off being marketed towards families um, and towards women, but it's really interesting because it covers such a widespread of, of the demographic, uh, even though this is, this is a middle class demographic that we're talking about to begin with. Uh, we're talking about um, traders, middlemen, um, rubber dealers, fish, uh, fishing dealers, uh, people in, in, in uh, uh, ties, uh, women who are going um, not just into the workforce, but also women of leisure as well, meeting their friends for a movie. Um, Milo has been targeted at all these sorts of people. And the comic strips that come out from that time really talk about these scenarios where it's great to have Milo after a movie. Um, it's great to have Milo before you go off to work as a man. Um, it's great to have Milo with your khakis after work uh, before you start your badminton game. Um, and then the sports thing starts to come up actually by, I think, the mid-50s into the 60s. It starts to really ramp up. But it's not, a, it's not really an abrupt shift. It's a, more of a gradual thing. Um, you get the professional sports um, element of it, where you get the sponsorships of sports events. Um, I can't really remember which ones. Um, um, maybe you know more, Stephen, about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then you get people who are doing sports as recreation as well. So it all ties in. Um, you get women who are playing badminton, um, men who are playing other racket sports. Um, this whole idea of active, energetic, uh, people wearing uh, Western clothes, um, no longer in chong sams or, or other sorts of baju. Um, so there's something very, um, they're, they're tapping into, I think, a very aspirational ethic, which a lot of other advertisements were doing at the time as well. Um, but somehow, oh, and the other thing was Nestle's um, marketing reps uh, went for a lot of courses after World War II to learn how to be better marketers. Um, so it's, it's in a book uh, by um, this guy who wrote The Swiss in Singapore. Um, and I, I, can, I can give you the reference later. On that. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the talk. It's very, very interesting. Uh, I'm from the UK, so I was more familiar with Ovaltine and Horlicks. And obviously, the climate is very different in this part of the world. So those sorts of drinks, I've only really known them as... Uh, hot drinks and uh, generally something adults have at the end of the day so it could even be a you know before bedtime type drink and probably quite seasonal so they'd be more popular during the winter time than the summer so I wonder if part of the appeal here is that you can drink it with ice any time of the day any social occasion you know throughout the whole of the year so the Nestle's the big companies probably think they've got much more scope as to the type of marketing that they can make it appeal to. Um, I sort of wonder why this similar thing wasn't done 
in colder countries because as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been marketing towards children. The sort of equivalent would be something like LucasAid or Gatorade. And I wonder how those sorts of drinks compare to how Milo is marketed here. When, when did Gatorade and LucasAid come into the picture? Well, probably in the 80s. OK. Um, yeah, I, I, I do wonder whether it's something to do with timing um, as well, because uh, Milo's, uh, I guess, Milo sort of started off in the in the fifties, really, as a as a mess, um, instant food. Then um, maybe there was less choice at that point in time. Um, the it, I I think I think that's you've hit on a really good point about the fact that we, I mean, we have a wet and a dry season here, but we don't have those extremes of of temperature, and we don't have long nights and long days um, like like in temperate countries. The, but again, the ice, the iced Milo thing, um, it's, it's a bit tricky because it wasn't. I, 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 it's it plays into that narrative about the democratization of of food uh, to the masses. So, ice Milo was something that initially could only be consumed by those who could afford to go to milk bars. Some of them, Nestle, one Nestle actually set up a milk bar in Singapore um, to get you know. Essentially, these were taste workshops to get people to try ice Milo there, um, besides hot Milo. So they were trying all these different combinations. And the advertisements also were, were targeting different times of the day as well. From the, as, I think, as early as the 30s, they already started. And they would make it quite clear that Milo was both a calming drink and a stimulating drink as well. Um, you can have it both ways, essentially, depending on what you think about the drink. Um, it's, in a way, all in your head. Um, so again, it goes to this idea of trying to get people to the, the widest possible market. Um, the Milo vans, I think, are such an important narrative for a lot of us because in a way that's, for many of us, that was our first taste of um, ice Milo in quite a creamy form as well. I, did, they, did they use condensed milk in, in that? I'm not sure. but. It's not. You, it's quite hard to get that 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 kind of Milo at home. You know? um, I mean, you've got this case in Malaysia where this mother and father chased down the Milo van so they could get the the ice Milo for their for their daughter who was craving it because she was pregnant. So it's it's that you know strange sort of thing. You know? um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. My question may not relate directly to Milo dinosaur. But what I understand about Milo, uh, based on a news article a few years back, and I think I just went through Wikipedia and checked it again, I think it tends to be very popular in, uh, in, uh, in certain parts of the world, like South Africa, Oceania, uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, I just want to understand, do you have any idea why, why these other countries, and even South America, that they are more popular with, with, uh, about Milo? It's also another thing that is quite common among these countries is that they are colonized. Is there a colonization kind of history towards Milo? That's why it's actually inside this, these countries. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We don't confront the colony, but we drink over here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and in Britain, um, it's, I mean, you can't really go by by the, the British map of the empire either because in Britain, it's Ovaltine that's the that's the big thing there. Um, but yeah, in New Zealand, Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, as you said, South Africa, um, South, South America as well. Yeah. Philippines, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I suspect it's marketing. I, I think it's a production and marketing sharing agreement uh, between the, the big food companies about how they divide up the world, so to speak. Um, but. Yeah, we, we, we need somebody to do these global histories of, of uh, multinationals in a way, and that will give us a bigger um, picture of these things. Yeah, uh, we, we can. I, I'm I'm as far as I can do. We are just covering this this region, um, and that in a way I think is useful to bring out some of the local texture, um, uh, and maybe in future, you know, it's a future project. We can look at other parts of the world as well. Thanks.